All right. Hey, everybody. It's the Headbangers Book Club. It's been a while, uh, so we might as well remind you of who we are. My name is Zach. My name is Kelly. And uh, yeah, it took us, uh, we, we lost a, a, a whole month. <laughs> and I guess I can, I guess I can get into to, to why. I mean, you know, I'm, it's... I'm done apologizing for that. You know, yeah, you know yeah. what to expect at this point. It's just, We're it's not just a regular po- uh, podcast. Right. We don't, I feel we don't like, have a regular recording schedule. We don't have a regular release schedule, and I'm I'm not interested in having. And we one. never will. <laughs> I'm not interested in it. <laughs> I, I I feel like this one is a is, it's it's a rare it, it's a rare one where it wasn't necessarily because we burned out. It was a, like a weird confluence of things. Like so, okay, so we're we're reading. Let's let's start from the beginning. We're we're reading uh, Meatloaf's biography. Uh, Meatloaf to hell and back to hell and back. Yeah, thank you. I I could not. I literally could not remember the title. Uh, we're we're reading that, and we only bought one copy because because you know, I'm not fucking buying it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what it is. You can say whatever you're gonna say, but ultimately, it's because I refuse to buy it. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just gonna say there's there's not that many copies to go around. It's it's out of print, so I was like, I bought it, and I was like, okay, well, let me just read this real quick. And I'll send it to Callie. And uh, the problem with that is that I did not read it very quick because I just didn't feel like it. So I, so I guess it really is sort of about burnout. Yeah. Because, <laughs> like, we got the, a tight release schedule for Sebastian Bach, and this is yeah. the backlash from that. Yeah. What, it, what it comes down to is always, like, no matter what we say the reason <laughs> is, the, what it honestly always comes down to is uh, we didn't fucking feel like it, so I don't even know why I'm bothering. <laughs> well, this one it was like it was like cumulative because you got it and didn't want to read it, and it took forever. Right, and then finally I got it, and I didn't want to fucking read it. Right, exactly. I was, so it was, I was so playing so... the herbs. I I decided to replay the herbs. I don't know if y'all know what that is. It's The Sims, but. <laughs> Uh, with the, but the but, but the black eyed peas are in yeah, it as, li- as literally, characters. Literally that. Um, <laughs> and you just have to like work your way up the social ladder by becoming friends with everyone. Yeah, it's good stuff. And I just wanted it's, to play it. And so instead of reading Meatloaf's book, I was making friends with a whole bunch of different cliques in the city. And, it was, and it was having great. read Meatloaf's book, I, I I don't think you made the wrong choice. I mean, it wasn't bad. Like it's it it was not a you know. This wasn't a complete miserable slog once we finally got around to it. Uh, no, I'm but... sorry. I needed a break. There's a lot going on. And um, reading about Meatloaf's favorite concussions was not enough to distract <laughs> me from like the ongoing struggles in the United States. So, Yeah, it's, it's almost like you, it should feel like an escape. Uh, but you know, somehow it isn't. So <laughs> somehow it, it only his makes... life is stressful. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> like it's stressful for stupid reasons, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, not you know, always. It's there, there. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't want to discredit the fact that he has. You know, his his upbringing was not the best. Oh, that um, is true. And yeah, also that are, yeah. he got sued. He got completely fucked over by his record. <laughs> Uh, I don't even know who they were. Like it wasn't his record label. It was just like the the people. Was this like his accountants? I didn't. I barely read this. this year. I, 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 I didn't. Mean, yeah, I it. think it was his. I think it was his management. It's like you know every it, the the thing that happens to every rock star ever. Okay. Yeah. Like he he got fucked over. He got he got sued by Jim Steinman. He got sued right. by everyone, and he was like living in poverty for like ten years. So right. I mean, some of it was. Definitely stupid Le- stuff. Legitimately but, stressful. But some of yeah, it was you're, actual you're right. stressful stuff. Right. And I don't right. want to discredit yeah. that. It's a little less stressful than like mass shootings and Roe versus Wade being overturned. But you know, I, I mean, th- that's kind of like the baseline of our existence. So again, it's not an <laughs> excuse. It's just it's it's just what's happening. Uh, so we finally got around to it. Is what I'm saying. Um, we you know april was a total wash i think we we had an idea for for a book uh this month but that's obviously not happening and uh and we're only doing one episode on meatloaf which actually works out just fine because the book is very short um which makes it even funnier than it's like so long to, to, to read. <laughs> Uh, so we'll be back on schedule i think we're planning on doing uh morris day's book in june so that'll be fun. That'll be a different Morris Day of 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 the time. 
uh, it's our uh, it's our Jerry Curl June tie in. So we're kind of getting away. We're getting away from the uh, the trashy rock stuff and doing a, a, a trashy funk biography. Uh, and this will be the second book we will have read that was ghost written by David Ritz, who also wrote the the more readable of, of, of the two Rick James biographies <laughs> we read way back when. So I'm excited for that. I think it'll be fun. I've already read it once. Um, it's a pretty it's a pretty quick read. Also, I mean, all of our books like uh, it's, it's not exactly fucking War and Peace what we're talking about here. <laughs> like none of the books are really difficult reads in the traditional sense of the word uh it's really just a motivation issue uh so let's talk let's let's do some uh let's do some listener listener comments because we did hear from you guys while we were out first of all i want to i these are in no particular order but i want to apologize to uh to humongous uh our loyal listener humongous also known as let let me let me try to say this correctly so it's like I always say his name wrong, and it, I think it's because I pronounce the word automaton. So I always try to make like I get the pun, but I always try to make it sound like automaton. And I really should just say automaton. So it's automaton, like O T T O maton. So um, that's just I, I was I was trying to say my pretentious way of saying automaton. And uh, and it, it mangled his name. So um, anyway, Humongous, aka uh, aka. I see. I have to. I I get caught up every time. Aka Automaton. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. He, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just gonna call him Humongous. <laughs> is, is that like is that a thing? It was like. <laughs> well, it's just like his pen name. It's just like a yeah, like a like an like an uh, auto, uh, automaton or an automaton is like a robot. So uh, he made so he he turned that into like a name, like a first name, last name. Oh, uh, okay. and but I always say automaton, which doesn't map very this well is, on the auto. This is the dynamic of our podcast is that we have like one one person who's very, very smart and like just <laughs> suffers from pretension, and then the other person who's just like, I don't fucking know what's going on. <laughs> too stupid I don't to get understand it. this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it works, uh, <laughs> <laughs> at least for, for our five listeners. Uh, but one of our five listeners, I, I have to apologize to him because uh, last time I said I was talking about how we're not on Spotify anymore. And last time I said that nobody was listening on Spotify. Turns out he was listening on Spotify. So it turns out a solid 20 percent of our listeners were, <laughs> were actually on Spotify. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. I thank you for thank you for sticking around. And I'm and I'm sorry that my. Uh, one-sided beef with um, fucks his name. Um, I'm legitimately blanking on his name. Joe Rogan. I, I that was not just shade. I was legitimately blanking on his name. My one-sided beef with Joe Rogan uh, uh, got got between us and one of our most loyal listeners. So uh, so thank you for for sticking with us despite the inconvenience. Uh, I guess while we're on the subject, also humongous. Uh, he came out as a Dread Zeppelin fan after we after we kind of uh, poked fun at Dread Zeppelin. Uh, Callie responded, thumbs down, and he said, "I'm sorry to hear that. Your life must be so dreary and gray, which it is. Uh, that's 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 accurate. I don't know. We were just I think I'm a better it. person for it that I don't. <laughs> yeah, to Dread it's unrelated. It has nothing to do with Dread Zeppelin, but uh, but yeah, I mean, we we were just talking about how we were literally. Uh, too riddled with anxiety to make it through this meatloaf book. So <laughs> I do have a playlist on Spotify that's just white uh, reggae, and it has snow on it, and it has the the dude who did the song on the Dumb and Dumber soundtrack. So maybe I'll <laughs> seek out some. Oh, the Police are on it. They have some reggae. Oh, yeah. Elvis right. Costello. So maybe I'll seek out Dread Zeppelin and and put them on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another one of our frequent commenters, uh, Marty White, said, so far this new series deals with a lot of shocking content. There's fish and vaginas, burned pubic hair, shit and hats, <laughs> and major drug abuse. But the most shocking thing of all is Axl Rose and a fax machine. Somehow I can't imagine that he'd know how it works. Now, Gene Simmons, on the other hand, probably has 17 fax machines. But Axel, I can't imagine having him having any knowledge of technology beyond the can and string telephones kids would play with. And Kelly said, uh, well, he knows how to work a stereo and speaker so he can blast Dred Zeppelin. 
uh, and Marty White also uh, came out as at least somebody who knows uh, who, who knows of. I, I won't say a Dred Zeppelin fan, but at least somebody who knows of them. So we, we apparently have a lot of overlap with Dred Zeppelin. We have we have to tread lightly <laughs> next time we're I'm making not, fun of. <laughs> I'm not treading lightly. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so Their name is Dred say... Zepp. What do these what do these clowns look like? Hold on. <laughs> this is research. I'm doing some research for the podcast. I'm just role. picturing the Led Zeppelin, but they all have dreads. That's that's what that's what I'm seeing in my. Oh mind. my god. Yeah. Hey, boys, no, I y'all, y'all deserve to be clowned. <laughs> Send me the picture so I can uh, so I can put it in the. <laughs> <laughs> they all look like professional wrestlers, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> That's even better than I than I imagined. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake! I mean, honestly, I don't even. I can't even choose a picture. Literally, just Google them, and and any yeah. of the images that pop up are suitable for how I feel about them. <laughs> uh, one more comment to get to get out here. Uh, Jay May, another another longtime listener. Uh, he shared a, a, a video of, of Gene Simmons falling on, on stage, uh, I think. Oh, it's from 2016. I was actually kind of hoping that it was from more recently, which is, <laughs> which now, <laughs> now that I've said that out loud, it's really fucked up. Because <laughs> what did Gene Simmons do to me other than, you know, burn, bitch, burn? Like, there's not really that. Like, <laughs> I don't actually well, would you, wish Would Ill. you rather see Gene Simmons fall off the stage or would you rather see him put an entire microphone into his mouth? I would, uh, I would rather see the former. Yeah, that's actually fair. Uh, when I said, what did Gene Simmons do to me? He he filleted, he he deep-throated a microphone at the concert we went to. So, so actually, <laughs> that, I, it is, it that is was fine. a personal attack. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was from 2016, but... Um, you know, I don't, I don't wish, I don't wish ill on Gene Simmons. We were just talking about the last episode how uh, we um, weirdly f- uh, found ourselves sympathizing with him in this in this Sebastian there, Bach. Well, there have been quite but, a few things he said recently that I've been like, okay, I, I, I yeah. can't believe I'm actually agreeing with Gene Simmons. Like, and but- right, and I. I it's it's like it's like the Overton window or whatever. It's like I don't know if I don't know if we're drifting uh further astray or if gene simmons is you know like i don't know or is it well or is okay it a, so a, there's always it's always with a caveat though because like yeah. the, the thing i'm thinking about that was like the most recent is when elon musk um acquired twitter oh and right gene simmons was like congratulations but then he also said make sure that hate speech isn't part of it so first of all it's a very low bar Right, <laughs> yeah, coming out against hate speech, <laughs> and, and then yeah. the, the 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 thing to that is that I I do not congratulate Elon Musk on owning Twitter or whatever the fuck. No, why do why do you need to congratulate Elon Musk on I don't a- know. anything? We should clown Elon Musk as much as possible. Like, what are we losing? Yeah, He's gonna exactly. Be fine. And <laughs> I, I don't even want to get into it. Anyway, I'm tired of these anyway. people. <laughs> uh, there was one comment that I that I lost, and I don't know if it's because. YouTube deleted it, or I don't know if it's because uh, the person who commented thought better of it and decided not to <laughs> speak ill of the dead. <laughs> but I've never had a problem with that, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read it. I, I won't I won't attribute I won't attribute it because I don't I don't have it in front of me, and I don't um you know so I, I can't say like who who it was. But I I remember it was after we announced that our book was meatloaf, and this will be a good this will be a good segue into the meatloaf discussion. Uh, their their comment was, "I would do anything for love, but I won't get vaxxed." <laughs> and oh, I yeah, thought that I was funny. That too. <laughs> so if if that had if YouTube hadn't eaten that comment, that would have been my favorite this episode, and I would have invited that person to to send me their address, and I would send them a, a sticker, a Headbangers Book Club sticker. But since that comment was either they. Uh, you know, woke up in the middle of the night and and felt bad about it, or or or, or YouTube, or or like some angry meatloaf fans <laughs> petitioned to have it removed. <laughs> Whatever the situation is, uh, I, I it, it it's no longer there. Uh, so now uh, runner up is Marty White talking about Axl Rose and the Fax Machine because yeah, that is I I didn't really think about it, but what was other than apparently apology letters from David Lee Roth. What was Axel Rose receiving via fax? Like, <laughs> well, I, I also think like none of these, 
I, I can see Sebastian Bach with a fax machine, but like David Lee Roth makes no damn David sense with a fax machine either. <laughs> like I feel like he would just be faxing images of his butt or something. <laughs> right. Like David Lee Roth's to, life to, to, to me. To Eddie Van Halen. Yeah. <laughs> David from from Club Dave. Um, yeah. <laughs> David Lee Roth's life to me is it, it just looks like. The I'm just a gigolo video. Like right, I, I can't right. imagine yeah, this in man my... in an environment that is not wacky. Yeah, like, what is David Lee Roth's office? What does his home it's, office it's look like? Like, <laughs> like the uh, the set, the like new set at the beginning of yeah. Just a Gigolo. <laughs> He's always falling asleep at his desk, and people are waking up by going, "Dave!" <laughs> 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 and then he wakes up in, in, in a flurry and he's like faxing <laughs> apologies to Sebastian Bach and Axel Rose. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Marty White, uh, the, thank you. Thank you for the comment. If you're interested, give us a message. You can, you can send it to, uh, you can put it on, on Twitter or, or send it to headbangers at dystopiandanceparty.com and let us know what address we should send it to. And we will get a sticker in the mail to you. And uh, one more, I'm gonna I'm gonna shout out Humongous one more time because I I just literally this morning I don't know what I, I know you don't know what day this is because we're recording it and it's not live. But just this morning, as of the time of recording, I put your stickers in the mail, so they should be making their way to you as we speak. So, like I said, the. I won't get Vax comment. Um, <laughs> I wasn't sure if I wanted to broach this this subject because you know he did just die, uh, and that is that is sad. Like I I legitimately you know Meatloaf should die, and and honestly like addressing the fact that he one of his. <laughs> One of his last publicly stated opinions was was against uh, COVID nineteen vaccine requirements. You know that that doesn't mean that I think that he should have died. Like I think in in a way it's even sadder that he had these you know delusional beliefs and then they ended up killing him. Like that's uh, that's tragic. You know, um, I I feel so. It de- for something like this, it depends on. Uh, if that person was a politician or not, because right. if if it's when there's like politicians who were espousing those same ideas and they die, I'm like fucking good. But oh yeah, I, when but Trump I felt was bad in about the meatloaf, so. yeah, when 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 Trump got COVID, I I was like, God, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> we're gonna have our our podcast flagged by the I know CIA. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, <laughs> I just won't finish that sentence. You, you fill in the blanks, but you know, but yeah, wouldn't that right. be like, great me- if he had wonderful <laughs> medical care not not available to the general public and survived? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that, luckily we for us, that's what, what I know. <laughs> <laughs> but so, yeah, it's like Meatloaf's opinions about the COVID nineteen vaccine might be wrong, but they're not affecting anybody's access to the vaccine. They're not affecting anybody except presumably, you know, hopefully he didn't give COVID to anybody. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, it's like if you were gonna get COVID though, wouldn't you rather get it from Meatloaf? <laughs> Oh, no question. A hundred percent. Even if it was fatal, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be happy about it, but I would be like, well, at least it was meatloaf and not (laughs) Ted Cruz or, you know, or some some chuckle fuck customer at my job who doesn't wear a mask. I'd much rather, yeah. like if it was going to be anybody maskless and stupid, I would much rather be coming from meatloaf, the same air that gave us. (laughs) <laughs> it's bad out of hell. <laughs> Fuck yeah, that right. can give me COVID. Yeah, from, from that, the that from the true. lungs of the man who brought us bad out of hell one and two. Right. <laughs> can you imagine uh, how much COVID droplets he could emit with that powerful <laughs> voice? <laughs> 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 um uh so yeah i mean we're you know we're we are sad we are officially sad about meatloaf uh we are also having read his book and seen how many literal concussions he got it, it let's just say it explained a lot about his uh his later positions <laughs> on certain issues like, I, I was like well he has been severely concussed. He may be one of the most concussed human beings to ever live. A chapter uh, so. in this book is called "My Favorite Concussions." <laughs> right? Yeah. Did 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 you keep track of the of the number of concussions 
by any chance? No, but because he didn't. It's either. a lot. It's a lot. The, nobody, nobody kept track. Right. Of them. He at least started keeping track of them, but then. You know, the thing about concussions is you can start to keep track of them, but after a while, it's no longer going to be reliable. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, but it was definitely, it was absolutely in the double digits. And like, when I say double digits, like way more than 10 uh, there, it was, it was at least 20, I think. Um, and it was started in, in childhood. Like It was very, I was like, wow, what a weird motif for this book that I was not expecting what was just you know every couple of pages he'd get a concussion honestly um, he's he's lucky to be as alive as long as he was right. because a lot of people <laughs> get a head injury and then just like fucking die because they had a hemorrhage right and didn't know about it so like the fact that he lived to be this age is honestly a miracle given how many concussions he purports to have had within his life <laughs> so let's talk about it yeah. <laughs> having said that having uh you know gotten the elephant in the room out of the way um that's that's the worst it's going to get in terms of talking ill of the dead i don't bear any ill will to meatloaf uh, i certainly don't bear any ill will to jim, jim steinman who we also lost uh last last year so this is kind of like a um a, a, a double a double header. I mean Jill Jim Steinman's a fucking weirdo, but I knew that before I read this book, so I'm not, you know, disillusioned. Um this book and I am also dealing with a challenge where I I read this book like a full month ago. So <laughs> my recollection is not going to be uh great. Uh but what I do definitely remember is of all the books we've read, this this is probably the one that most clearly was not actually written in the traditional sense. And I know we say this about all, about a lot of books. Like we said this about Crazy from the Heat. We said this about uh, Sebastian Bach's book, which was the, the last couple of episodes we did. Um, but you can really tell that this was like as told by Meatloaf because there are so many like tiny little chapters and they all have titles and you can just tell that it's like whatever nugget, the interviewer, the the guy who actually wrote the book, whatever nugget he got out of meatloaf, you know, he put that down in the word processor and then they'd come back again the next day and he'd get another <laughs> story out of meatloaf. Like it's, it's, it's a very episodic book. Um, and there's, there's four big chapters that are like, you know, each it's roughly a quarter of the book each. And then each one of those has like, I don't know, like 20 subheadings. Uh, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. And it's so like, you can kind of scroll through the book and you, and, it, and it's like, you get an idea of what it, 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 it makes it easy to find what you're looking for. I think we said a similar thing about Sebastian Bach, you know, like meatloaf, the Christmas burglar. I, I remember, I remember <laughs> that was uh, when he wanted to open his presents before Christmas, and he had the brilliant idea of saying that somebody broke into the house and <laughs> and opened the presents, um, <laughs> which is he said that because he was a child and not because he'd been concussed. <laughs> Although I think he I think he had been concussed at that point. <laughs> so you know it makes it handy when you kind of half remember the book because I can because I can be like oh what was uh what was you want to meet a beach boy about? Oh yeah. That was about what he picked up Charles Manson while he was hitchhiking. You know, it's, it's like a, it's like a little mnemonic device. <laughs> <laughs> so first part is called bad out of Texas. It's about meatloaf's childhood, which was really fucked up. I, I didn't know this about him. Um, I really didn't know anything about meatloaf other than he uh, released two of the greatest albums of all time and was, you know, a, a big dude uh, who made that kind of like his, his persona. I was, um, I was surprised. Uh, you know, I, it, it sounds weird to say, cause it's not really that surprising when you think about it, but he, uh, he genuinely was hurt by the jibes about his weight. Like that's a really recurring theme. Like he, he, he started, he called himself meatloaf because he was so scarred by an old Levi's commercial, which I, I don't was certainly before my time. I don't remember it, but it, but I guess the tagline was poor, poor fat Marvin can't wear Levi's, which is a really weird and fucked up way to advertise your jeans. <laughs> um, not very body positive. 
<laughs> it's also like, so you're saying that there are people who can't wear your product? That just seems kind right. of backwards. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's just a, even just if you're a not weird... factoring fat phobia into it, it's also just like, why? Wh- what purpose does this serve to say that some people can't wear them? <laughs> From a sales perspective, it just seems weird. Yeah, the whole thing's just weird. Uh, but you know, so he was born Marvin, and I guess that was like he was he was teased, uh, and so you know he hates he hates calling himself Marvin. Uh, like does not explain why he then chose the name meatloaf, which is basically a fat joke. Uh, but I guess, you know, I guess he's taking it back. He's, he's taking ownership. He's reclaiming. It. Yeah. He's reclaiming meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the derogatory term meatloaf. The, 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 yeah. The, 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 the vicious slur meatloaf. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's an, uh, that, that, that's an interesting story. I, I might've actually known this, that he was actually, he was called meatloaf since childhood and has been, you know, very consistently, that's just his name. And I don't even think he's like a, he's not even like a Chris Ludacris Bridges where, when he started acting, uh, because I feel like there's a whole generation that now knows him better as an actor. And, um, well, that he was, really a, he was originally an actor. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so it was kind of like full circle. Yeah, but uh, you know, he goes by Meatloaf even in even in movies, and uh, and as we know, um, <laughs> this wasn't in the book, but uh, he goes by Meatloaf. He went by Meatloaf when he was on The Celebrity Apprentice. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed when he died, there was something trending. Um, it was whatever line from Fight Club when his character in Fight Club died. It was like. His name was Robert something. I don't. I don't remember the name. Um, I've only seen Fight Club I once. I literally just uh, saw Fight Club like a month ago, and yeah, I don't remember. But, it, but his For name was Bob. Time. It was. It was Bob with the bitch tits. Uh, that's uh, that's all I remember. But um, you know, I saw that trending, and I was like, wait, what? And then I had. And then I thought about it. And I was like, oh, like for some people, meatloaf is. Like, that's how they know Meatloaf as the guy from Fight Club, which is really weird. Like, I can't even say it makes me feel old because it's probably more my generation. Right. <laughs> Fight Club is is more appropriate than Bad Out of Hell. But obviously, I'm fucking here for Bad Out of Hell. Yeah. Like, I don't, well, I don't give a Rocky shit about Well, and Rocky Horror, too. Like, I knew him mainly <laughs> yeah. from... I, I literally just saw Fight Club for the first time, like, a month or two ago. Didn't, right. didn't like it. But um, I love Rocky <laughs> Horror, and, and I love Meatloaf in Rocky Horror. Yeah. Oh, that's one of the best parts. That's one of the best parts of that movie. And the song is, is one of the best songs. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, he had a fucked up childhood. Yeah, I was... guess that's, uh, I started that and, and I didn't really finish that, that thread, but yeah, like his, his dad, uh, was an alcoholic and abusive and, um, you know, it's like, I don't know. There's not, <laughs> there's not that just, much to say. It was just it upsetting. Was really... I did like yeah. how, he, how he talked about his hometown and the people there. And it, I, I actually didn't know that, um, meatloaf was from Texas. No, I didn't either until I read the words bad out of Texas. Yeah. <laughs> that was the first clue, <laughs> yeah. which is kind of funny. I, I don't know. And, and, and we'll get to this later, I guess, but it's it's interesting that he spent so much time in Detroit. Like, I thought that was cool because <laughs> I feel like a, like Sebastian Bach spent a, some time at the beginning of his career in Detroit, yeah. too. But it's cool to hear it from Meatloaf because he was around all of these, like, bands from Detroit that I know a lot about being from Michigan and, you know, like... I've, I've read guitar army and stuff so i'm like familiar with a lot of the stuff he was talking about um but but it's funny to hear it from meatloaf's perspective as a n- like he's not from michigan and so a lot of his like perspective and thoughts on these groups was really funny <laughs> yeah i was not expecting i, w- I was not expecting that yeah um, i didn't know he was in motown either yeah because like i knew i i knew the loose trajectory I, I i'm sure i've seen like a meatloaf behind the music at some point in my life or something you know so i i knew that like he started out, like you said, he started out in musical theater, which makes a, a lot of sense <laughs> for, for you know, the music that he got famous with. I knew that him and Jim Steinman spent a really long time shopping around Bad Out of Hell before it finally got made. You know, that whole story was familiar to me. I knew, obviously, that he was in Rocky Horror, and I'd heard of the name Stoney and, and Meatloaf. I, I knew he was in Hair, but I, I didn't know about this whole Detroit sojourn Um which it, it was when he was in the Detroit production of Hair, right? Or, or yeah. Was it well, I think it started with then? that, and then he had a band out there. Yeah, yeah. 
Or um, I guess why am I saying out there? I'm I'm in Detroit. Right. <laughs> in a band here. Yeah. <laughs> well, Detroit was different back then. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was it was cool. It was like, oh, this is like you know, this is familiar and welcome territory. We're uh, talking about the Grand Ballroom and the MC5 and the Stooges and uh, the Amboy Dukes even. <laughs> <laughs> we Ted, all know our, our complicated relationship with, with Ted Nugent. Um, oh, that's another chapter in Meatloaf's career that I'm, of course, very familiar with is his uh, his amazing vocals on uh, the Ted Nugent album, Free For All. Oh, yeah. Which, yeah. yeah. And you know what? That uh, When I read that, I was like, okay, it makes more sense now why he was playing with right because it's like ted nugent knew him yeah, yeah. it was I, I i always think it was kind of random like uh derek st holmes got kicked out of the band and they just got meatloaf like it just seemed weird to me i mean, I, I always did kind of wonder like how that happened and now i know that they were old uh i don't know about friends but they they were old acquaintances from from the detroit days so that was cool i liked um the part where he um advised his guitarist to not join grand funk railroad and then like the next week or whatever grand funk railroad made it made it big and he he completely destroyed this man's life (laughs) yeah the uh the name of that the name of that section was uh what was it was was the the worst worst, advice the worst advice i ever gave yeah Uh, oh and i also liked um like I'm just kind of going through some of this because this early part, there's not a whole lot to talk about. It was just stuff I thought was interesting. But um, when he was the bodyguard for a uh, question mark oh, for from question 96 mark, years. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the story there was that question mark was like crazy, right? Like, yeah, that basically. So was, uh, they put me in a room right next to him. They're talking about question mark. I never yeah. got any sleep. I was up 24 hours a day with this guy. He was fine during the day when everybody was moving around and stuff was going on. And on the days <laughs> of the shows, he seemed to be okay. He never said anything. Basically, he just led, he just, uh, led her on the from place to place and wrap her on sunglasses. I don't remember ever having a conversation with him. If he did talk, he spoke Spanish. So that was another reason I didn't understand him. I had a key to his room and at night I would listen to his door every hour on the hour just to make sure there was nothing going on. One night I heard strange noises coming from Question's room. I unlocked the door and went in. He was prowling the room and muttering terrible curses at some unseen demon. Broken chair, broken lamp. I grabbed him and took him into my room. He'd gone completely feral. He tried to bite me. I threw him <laughs> on the bed and called the Mysterians, and together we succeeded in subduing him. Kinda. I mean, he tried smoking pot to calm himself down, but only succeeded in throwing up. He was a mess. I thought I was a mess. It was a weird kind of self-help cure. <laughs> Take care of someone in worse shape than you are. <laughs> well, I like the part about the the the, the mysterious uh, having to physically they restrain him. <laughs> yeah. And I also just like imagining Meatloaf. I always imagine him. This is another thing that I remember Meatloaf from, a, like his role in Wayne's World, where he's just like right. his bodyguard, and he has to keep <laughs> knocking on the door every hour in the middle of the night. Uh, yeah, he had a. It's I I like his. Um, he really just kind of falls into being meatloaf. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, I thought one, one part that I will say, like, yeah, I don't have that much to say about his, about his, his childhood. Um, it's, it's his first uh, five or six concussions or whatever. Uh, and then it's like a lot of stories. Um, some of which are, you know, amusing and some of which are depressing. But one thing that did, one of the first things in the book that kind of stuck out to me was there's the the section called Four Songs, where he was basically, the gist of it is, like, again, I haven't read it in a while, but the gist of it is that um, there's really only four songs that are that important to him. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought it was funny because, like, you go from, because uh, we talked about this with Sebastian Bach's book. Like, he's such a fan of rock music and that's like his his whole thing is 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 about what a big fan he is and even like you know i still follow him on twitter and he's he's always talking about some like some new kiss bootleg or you know like like, some japanese thing that he he i I follow him on youtube too and he'll like (laughs) there he'll there's a couple times where he was like um 
in Amoeba Records, and he did a What's in My Bag, and he was always mm. looking for this, like, specific Japanese uh, press of some Kiss albums. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. And, like, you know, I mean, I, I don't think that literally Meatloaf has only liked four songs. Like, I think Well, this he, was also he obviously... when he was a child. I think that's right. important. Like, I'm sure he has more of an appreciation of music now, but... Right. Yeah, and he... Uh, well, I mean, not now, but... Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Well, now he appreciates music because he's everything. So yeah, and because he hears <laughs> he is a all music. The time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but uh, but I mean, it's it's just kind of it's just interesting that like he wasn't like oh I I always wanted to be a rock singer. He just kind of like ends up getting into it, and 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 then like when he gets into hair, he was he went to the production because he wanted a job parking cars. Yeah, I was just gonna uh, mention that, and then they bring him in for the audition, and he's just like, uh, I I don't know, I. I came here to park cars. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he sings and he's meatloaf. So it's like, it's, it just makes the story, uh, that much more interesting. Cause he's like, you know, wildly talented. Uh, and it just happens. Like he just kind of stumbles face first. I mean, not into success. Like he definitely, it takes forever for him to become successful, but in terms of just being a singer, uh, it just sort of happens to him uh, while he's trying to get a menial blue collar job. Um, like some of the stories are, some of the chapters are like, there was no point to this. Like the chapter, this drummer's got no fingers was about when he oh, yeah. put together a band and the drummer was missing fingers. <laughs> That's the story. Uh, it's pointless, but God, I'm glad it's in here. That was one of yeah. my favorite parts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also like the part where he's in that group in Detroit um, with Jake Wade and the Soul Searchers and he's the only white person in the group and the whole ch- it's a, in that chapter this is just Apple's Bananas is the title of the chapter and it's about how he would go into the audience and get everyone to yell Apple's Bananas and just <laughs> say all this crazy stuff because <laughs> he could really get the crowd going <laughs> and that's also the next chapter how do i look in my pimple deal right because yeah. he's because he's like driving around with the singer of this group and they're in like a um it's some like like a cadillac or you know oh. some like classic pimp car and i just it's just funny yeah, to imagine a a meatloaf in that situation yeah jake had taken the roof off his cadillac and replaced it with the lucite dome so there was this green plastic bubble up there on top of the car. We took this outlandish vehicle down south, and it wasn't well received. Whenever we pull into a motel, we'd get dirty looks. They refused to allow the black members of the band to enter the place. Never mind, stay there. And this was in the 70s. They wouldn't let Jake eat in the restaurant. Their attitude was like, are you guys out of your minds? You can't bring a black person in here. It's not, it's not funny. It's just like imagining Meatloaf in this situation. It's like, I just... Right, and it's like, how did he, how did he get here? Why is Meatloaf, yeah, I know, why exactly. is Meatloaf here? Exactly. <laughs> Probably the craziest. I, I feel like I would be, like, this isn't a, this isn't a funny story, but I, I feel like I would be remiss not to mention uh, the chapter, I lose my mom and my dad tries to kill me, which is literally what the chapter is. Like, he's yeah. not, there's no exaggeration here. Uh, his mom dies and, you know, his dad is a, is a drunk. And so um, basically the court rules that Meatloaf will get his the inheritance from his mom and his dad legitimately makes an attempt on his life, I guess, so that he can get the money, which is like, that's obviously not how it's going to how this is going to end. But, you know, his dad's clearly not in a in a rational frame of mind. And so that that's why he goes to, that's why he leaves Texas and goes to Detroit, right? That, like that's, well, that kind of yeah. precipitates. No, no, he leaves, he well, goes, he goes to, to Detroit LA because first, right? of hair. He leaves Texas and goes to LA first because LA. his mom is sick and he can't emotionally handle it. And so he just kind of oh, like, yeah. while she's still sick, he fucks off to LA and then he finds out his mom dies or is dying. And so he comes back and then while he's still back there, his um dad tries to kill him and then like some other stuff happens he somehow ends up back in la and then he goes from to detroit from there i think that's how it happened right right that is that sounds right (laughs) that sounds right and yeah i think you briefly mentioned so one thing that's interesting you know we talked about him riding in the pimple mobile uh, Meatloaf was uh, almost a Motown recording artist, which yeah, is really fascinating. Yeah, and the songs are on Spotify. I listened to them. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I, that's I, I'll have to check them out because that is I mean, like it makes sense. Like in a weird way, there there is like an alternate universe where Meatloaf would have basically been Mitch Ryder, you know, because he has a soulful voice. It's just that his niche ended up being musical theater basically he, instead well, of, he has he has a soulful voice but i don't think he sounds as soulful as mitch Ryder. i think his yeah. voice, voice does fit more with musical theater because even if you listen to motown songs like it, it just sounds like some white people singing <laughs> which is funny <laughs> because motown oh didn't they like not show them it was like uh oh what's that guy's that everybody is surprised that he's white. He's oh, that yacht rock uh, guy. The every every uh, every year, people are like, "Did you know Bobby Caldwell?" Yeah, Bobby Caldwell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> they were doing the Bobby Caldwell, where like you can't see him, uh, right. you can't see him or Stony because they're on Motown, and you won't reach the R and B audience if they know he's white. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is funny. <laughs> Cause, yeah. Because no one is gonna see Meatloaf and be like, "I'm gonna buy this R and B album." <laughs> Except maybe me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is probably, I mean, that's probably why it took him so long because like, what, what is his image even? I, and I think, I think we've, I don't remember we talked about this on the podcast before, but like, there's not that many fat guys in, in rock, you know, in, in like, especially in, 70s rock this is yeah there's a guy from mountain and meatloaf and that's about it right that's basically it yeah like you know there was some there was some husky husky boys like some of those detroit guys were were you know big dudes but they weren't yeah rob tyner was a husky little guy but he wasn't right like like, meatloaf is a big tall dude yeah (laughs) yeah and so it's like what is his what is his image like uh, you know, I, I guess I've never seen hair, so I don't know where he fits into that. Um, other than he was apparently nude. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, like, it was funny because they also, when he, he was on Motown, the, him and Stoney did uh, this song called Who is the Leader of the People, which is very much like it doesn't make sense for a white person to sing it. <laughs> but they were, he was kind of like myth that they gave it to Edwin Starr and then just use the vocals in the background. But what's funny yeah. about that is if you listen to it, you can hear Meatloaf. <laughs> I'm going to have to check that out. Because yeah. <laughs> it is like when he was just like a journeyman singer, like on Free For All, I'd always heard that Meatloaf sang on that. And I was like, oh, it probably just sounds like kind of Derek St. Holmes like, you know, I'm sure I'm sure it doesn't literally sound like Meatloaf. But then you listen to Hammer Down <laughs> and it's like, holy shit, <laughs> he's going like full throttle. <laughs> <laughs> so he's he has just has this just years and years of him almost making it because of these weird image issues and then he meets Jim Steinman and they're obviously you know they artistically connect but also Jim Jim Steinman has no idea of like how to make his music saleable and there's all these stories about him just like completely bombing in a record company audition or whatever because he he plays some you know ridiculous brechtian thing that like no no record (laughs) executive is ever going to like (laughs) and he just like refuses to not be jim steinman you know for any for any reason so yeah it takes them it takes them like five years to get bad out of hell made and the story is that they finally got it made because Todd Rundgren thought it was funny, <laughs> but, but, but they're like, no, we're dead serious. <laughs> I'd also like, just as a sidebar, I'd just like to note that Todd Rundgren is responsible for pretty much all of my favorite American music. <laughs> yeah. It's a, he is like a, like a, a, a zealot figure. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's also different too. Like you you listen to Bad Out of Hell and you don't think, oh, this is a Todd Rundgren production. It doesn't sound like any of his stuff. Um, it certainly doesn't sound like we're an American band. <laughs> yeah, or Hall and Oates or right. Yeah, he he is like I wonder how many how many of the books we've read have had some 
connection to to Todd Rundgren. Obviously, when we read Stephen Tyler's book, there's going to be I I imagine Todd Rundgren's name is going to come up uh, because he was lives surrogate dad but who knows maybe steven teller never mentions his daughter <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh let's see what what else um he was uh he was john belushi's body double at one point um i know that because there's a there's a chapter called i was john belushi's double and belushi <laughs> shows up quite a bit uh because they were apparently good friends i like the part where he mistakes Raquel Welch for Jane Fonda, and he's also in the nude when he does so. <laughs> oh, he's also naked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a good. Because <laughs> she's backstage at hair, right? And <laughs> yeah, let me see if I can find it. Oh, also, it's Raquel really funny. Welch and Jane Fonda do not look anything alike. They're like two completely different <laughs> I don't know. genres I of women. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I can I can see it if you're if you're meatloaf and you're nude and I don't know. I also I just guess. like okay. So the way he tells it is, is that <laughs> it's, it's just so needless for him to even have mistaken them because it's not like he was even meeting Raquel Welch. So it says I'm standing there uh, naked. Wait a minute. Okay, I gotta go back and really, because she's going to visit Tim Curry, um, right? Whose room is across from his, and he says my door was open and I'm standing there stark naked. There was my door in this little hallway and there's Curry's door. Curry's door was closed and she knocked on it and just turned around. I'm standing there naked and my only comment was, "Oh, it's Jane Fonda. You've never <laughs> seen anybody get so mad in such a hurry in your life." She was just horrified. I'm not sure if it was my mistake here for someone else or my being naked. But it's like, why did so you're just standing there naked with your door open and you just say loudly, "Oh, it's, it's Jane Fonda." So basically, he made a he made a faux pas because he has no internal monologue. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> the whole rocky horror thing i think is and he has like I, I i'm remembering that he has some some strong opinions about how like so i guess i i've never seen the rocky horror show but in the play it's eddie and the doctor Dr. Scott, Scott are played yeah. by the wrong per the, the same person right yeah and um and he had strong opinions about that not happening in the <laughs> <laughs> in the movie well, he also had strong feelings about being in drag and when they told him he was dr scott he had to be in, in drag and he, he he was like well guess what i was in drag <laughs> like he just ends up doing it <laughs> oh that's right yeah because he like didn't want to audition at first yeah um yeah because that's where beat Lo- loaf draws the line i guess <laughs> <laughs> but but obviously not because he ended up in drag <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> I'm mostly bringing this up just because I I, I feel like um, that's one of the great meatloaf moments. I just he's just so good in that movie. I like um, weirdly the story. It, it's in the like subchapter Phantom Blonde, but the story where uh, where are they? I think they're recording in some house, and um, Meatloaf sees a ghost. Which like first of all, I I believe in ghosts, so like I'm totally on Meatloaf's side with this. <laughs> But he sees he sees a teenage girl and it ends up being a ghost and he's like scared of it and so he has Jim Steinman come in his room and stay up with him all night and I was like this is so weirdly heartwarming <laughs> and Jim Steinman like told him that he like caught the ghost or something and, and stayed in the room with him all night <laughs> I was like this is adorable <laughs> yeah that is that is funny especially since like. I, I just feel like having Jim Steinman in the room is not going to make it less spooky. Like, it's, like, <laughs> it's like fucking Dracula keeping you uh, company, but you know, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember that. I, I, lo- I It made me wonder if uh, Meatloaf was ever on an episode of Celebrity Ghost Stories. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Sammy Hagar was and D oh, Snyder. So, yeah, I I remember you you and mom telling me the D Snyder. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because episode. the dude in the because you know they did the reenactments and the dude in the reenactment <laughs> did not look any. I think they used the same wig for D Snyder and Sammy Hagar, which is and why Sammy I remember Hager. them because it was literally just like a blonde wig, it's like, <laughs> just a blonde curly wig could be anyone, and I think they used it for both of their reenactments. <laughs> <laughs> was the Sammy Agar one? Was he dressed all in red leather? Yes. Or... <laughs> yeah, it was an all red outfit. 
I think, if I'm remembering correctly. Because how else are you going to recognize him? He's the red rocker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a, and it's not a current Sammy Hagar story, so he couldn't just be yeah. in like cargo, cargo yeah, shorts exactly. and, and he, he, That's who's telling the story, but the younger <laughs> Sammy Hagar is... <laughs> um, I also like the story... <laughs> the, this one is called They Don't Make Hotel Walls the Way They Used To. <laughs> Um, you can probably guess what's going to happen, but the, right. the, lead up, the lead up to it is that there is some, I think it was because they have black people in the band and they, they were in some, they were in New Orleans and mm. someone was racist, obviously. So they were saying that you, you can't play at this venue or whatever. And he said, if, if you play here, I'm going to shoot you. And Meatloaf took that to heart, which, which I, I'm with him. Like if someone yeah. threatens to shoot me because they're racist, I'm going to believe them. Um, the, the other people in his band and I think his manager were trying to convince him to do it and saying, oh, he was just bluffing or whatever. And so Beatloaf eventually solves the situation by putting his head through the wall. And I just wonder, like, I mean, it did, it did convince them to stop trying to get him to play the show, but I just wonder how, like, how did, how did this, how was this a successful, like, I'm just going to start putting my head through walls whenever I disagree with people. <laughs> It works for Beatlo. Yeah, if it works for Beatlo, it's good enough for me. Um, now I know why Sinatra slugged that guy. Oh, that was um, a good one. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, being pissed off at a, a journalist, right? Was yeah. that basically the yeah? Yeah, because I think it was an Australian journalist said something about his weight, and I think it oh was yeah, how I got to be larger at, than life. It starts with I'm asthmatic. <laughs> <laughs> and it's basically like, it's basically about how he has asthma and so he would get so worked up and sweaty on stage and out of breath <laughs> that he would like pass out because he could not get <laughs> oxygen into his into his lungs and so um he would have to be administered oxygen while on stage and so they made it into a, a riff like um james brown getting uh, like kneeling and having to have the cape put on him but it was having to have oxygen administered to him which i thought that was funny i also have asthma so i was like oh that's cool it's an interesting thing to come up three quarters of the way through the book like you you would think by the way i'm asthmatic (laughs) yeah you think that would have warranted uh, a mention earlier but i mean maybe not because as we've established he had an an action-packed life with many concussions. So, uh, <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to say, uh, like the the thing about the the journalist making a crack about his weight, and I I mentioned that that's like one of the things that kind of surprised me was how sort of sensitive about that he was. But I forgot to mention there was earlier in the the second chapter, I think it was uh, the, the 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 section called "With a Little Help from My Friend." He meets uh, Joe Cocker, who oh, like yeah. basically he doesn't know it's Joe Cocker yet, and he's like, uh, he, he, I don't know what what does he say? He says, so, I just so, love he, that he saw Leon Russell perform, and he was like, meh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, and uh, Joe Cocker basically tells him to lose some weight. Like I, I feel like it's like the way he says it, like it's. I guess kind of well-meaning like, cause I, I think Joe Cocker might've been saying like that he used to be fat or something yeah. like that, you know? Um, but it, it doesn't go over that well. And Meatloaf's just like, yeah, whatever. Fuck you, buddy. And then, and then Joe Cocker goes on stage and he's Joe Cocker and Meatloaf is like, <laughs> Oh, never, never mind. You can call me fat. Well, if you I think want. he wanted, <laughs> didn't he want to borrow the, uh, what, let me see, because it, it it's after, they lent their organ to the Grateful Dead thinking that, that, you know, they would just watch them play and then head home. But the Grateful Dead right. played for like four hours straight and they couldn't leave because <laughs> yeah. they wanted their organ. Um, there's so much, like, that's the thing, like, there's so much. It's just kind of like dull when you take it all in at once because it's just like all of these rock biographies, just like story after story after story. Right. But then when you actually like break it down and talk about it, it's like, okay, there was some good stuff in here. I was actually, I this is a, a, a rare complaint for me. I actually thought in some ways the book was a little bit too short because uh, like we, we were already like three quarters through the book. And I mean, part of this is because... Uh, we we don't remember it very well, <laughs> but you know, honestly, like, though we've been going in cr- basically chronological order, and there's yeah. not a whole lot to talk about. Like, yeah, the 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 first chapter was like up until 
young adulthood, basically. Uh, the second chapter is, you know, most of his like early pre Bad Out of Hell career. Then there's a whole, there's this chapter literally called Bad Out of Hell. Uh, yes, after the chapter called Bad Out of Texas, there are two cha- <laughs> there are two chapters playing on the, the the album Bad Out of Hell. But I guess if it, you're Meatloaf, what else are you going to make? And a it reference takes to? up the bulk of the book too. Like most yeah. of it is stories about shopping Bad Out of Hell around and yeah, recording is, Bad Out of Hell. This is the biggest chapter by far. And then, so we're now three quarters of the way through the book. And keep in mind, this is like 1977. Like I feel like this chapter ends you know, on the bad out of hell tour. So it ends in like 78, 79. And then part four is literally the rest of Beatles. Not, not literally the rest of his life, but up until the point that the book was written, which at the everything time is of, just crammed into the end. Yeah. And like, so he, it's like 25, 30 years. He gets married. <laughs> um, he kind of like guilts his, his wife into marrying him because he, they, they like just met and she's yeah. in a bad situation. He's also in a bad situation. And he pretty much, he says something about, like, if you, if you don't marry me, I'm going to rip my heart out and throw it into the snow. <laughs> Just, like, not a great way to propose to someone. Um, <laughs> kind of puts a lot of pressure on them to say yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so the rest of the book, like, I when I stopped reading a couple days ago or whatever i i was hurrying up and trying to finish today and it seems like when i stopped reading the other day he was still like touring and stuff and then all of what i read today was the rest of the book and it was like 50 pages right left, it's and it was like... all just like he got married he got sued and he he lived uh 10 years of his life being sued and, and having financial problems and then all of a sudden he had a, he has a comeback and it's just interesting and then I found out because because I was I looked up his wife, and it said ex-wife, and I'm like, well, in the book it says they're they're still together. This yeah. book was written a year before they got divorced. I know. I was <laughs> I was disappointed. I I have to admit, I was I was disappointed that um like I I felt like after all of that, you know, a- after going through all of that shit, I was like, man, it w- wouldn't it have been nice if they had stayed together? You yeah, know? I know. Well, that's what I happen. thought, and then when I looked it up, I was like, oh, that sucks. Yeah, he was being very optimistic in the book because he was like, wow, we weathered all of this and now, you know, we're stronger than ever. Yeah, she was, you know, she was probably serving the papers, year. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it is like, it's a whirlwind at the end. And I, you know, I can understand why, like, nobody wants to read an entire chapter of depressed meatloaf <laughs> having legal problems. Like, I understand that. But I would have liked to see more about... um Bad Out of Hell 2. I, I mean, maybe there's not that much more to say because Bad Out of Hell 2 is like, we did Bad Out of Hell again. I don't know. I feel like there's the whole saga of him, of Meatloaf and Jim Steinman. Now they're on the outs. Now they're reuniting. And, and just the fact that they're like creative soulmates. Like neither of them was ever really able to do what they were able to do together and some of the interesting parts of the book were like when they had a falling out it was because (laughs) because steinman wanted his name on the album like from the beginning he wanted to be like equal partners but that's just not how the record industry works like nobody really gives a shit that the music was by jim steinman it's meatloaf like that's why people are buying the album and you know he wanted to be on the album cover and, and all of that stuff and and so eventually they he gets jealous and decides he wants to do a solo career. I haven't listened to his, what was that? I think it was bad for good Jim Steinman's solo album, but I've heard that it's, you know, I mean, it's like production wise, it's very Steinman esque, but like, he can't sing like meatloaf. Yeah. <laughs> like nobody wants to listen to Jim Steinman trying to sing like meatloaf. <laughs> um, my favorite sisters of mercy song is written by Jim Steinman. <laughs> Just as a side note. Um, <laughs> That's a match made in heaven. Yeah, it, it's so good. I, I love that Jim Steinman, this is a mercy song. Um, but I just thought it was funny that Jim Steinman had such a problem with Meatloaf. Because at least according to Meatloaf, I don't know like how biased this is, but Meatloaf is saying that Jim Steinman was all like upset that Meatloaf would uh, be getting recognized like 
for his, his face and stuff, and no one would really care about Jim Steinman. But then, like, Jim Steinman was the one making all the money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Isn't that actually good that, like, he yeah, could... Yeah, I would much rather be a, a songwriter and have royalties and, and be getting money and still be able to, like, walk around and not be bothered than, like, Meatloaf is getting bugged at softball games and stuff. That sounds horrible. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. He's on TV with Gary Busey. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's my other big beef with this with this book is that it it stopped before he was on the Celebrity Apprentice, and I wanted like it was just such great television. One of the one of the things I love about Alexander O'Neill's book is uh, you get all the stories about Alexander O'Neill that you want to hear, and then you get like a full chapter of him uh, calling Perez Hilton the F-bomb on, on Big Brother. Like, that's, that's what I, I wanted a well, similar thing. Well, even in thing Sebastian Bach's Beatles, book, I, like, he talks about the reality TV. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There's, like, a whole long, yeah, like, the last third of the book is uh, Broadway and, uh, you know, Trailer Park Boys and, and, yeah. and Supergroup. It was, yeah, exactly. One of the I greatest moments in television was when, when that whole season was great <laughs> because it was Meatloaf, Gary Busey, Lil John. It was great, and, yeah. and the part that we're referencing is so loud. Like the oh my loud, god, like, it's the can loudest you, season. Can you think of a louder collection of people than Meatloaf, Gary Busey, and Lil Jon? Yeah, and, and you know, like this was before Trump was president. We all knew he was a shitbag, but it, it was like right. it was pretty, pretty like benign. Oh man, it was, so what happened was, and I I urge you to go find the clip on YouTube or something. They were they were looking for art. <laughs> supplies like they went to buy our supplies um for whatever the fuck project they were working on and for some reason meatloaf thought that gary Busey took his bag or something and he just the, like it's funny because whenever meatloaf blew up in this book like described his blow ups i'm like i've seen that because i've watched the celebrity <laughs> apprentice he just goes nuts on gary Busey, and then it turns out that gary Busey did not even steal his bag <laughs> It's just great, great television. Um, I really like the chapter where he's talking about Blind Before I Stop, the album that was produced by the uh, guy who put Millie Vanilli together. Oh, yeah. And so he said he recorded a actual rock album, and then when he was listening to it, they had changed the entire order of the songs, and they put a dance beat under it. Um, and I, just by that description alone, I... I was reading it and I'm like, okay, this is going to be my favorite Meatloaf album. I went and listened to it and it fucking rules. Uh, it's just like dumb, like corporate rock with uh, like, uh, like the kind of stuff that every rock star was making in the mid to late eighties where it's right. just like, it's just this rock music with a dance beat under it. It's great. <laughs> I love it. It's my, it's actually my favorite Meatloaf album. <laughs> It's good when you uh, when you, when you know yourself. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm definitely gonna have to check that out because you know, obviously, a big Millie Vanilli fan, uh, and a and a, of course a huge Meatloaf fan. Um, so it's like yeah, the so best, you cannot best of both go worlds. wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I thought I I, I want to know more about this this movie. Um, which one was it? It was it. Um... Oh, it's the one with Cher on it because Cher appears. Hold on, it is Dead Ringer from 1981. Oh, that, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. No, the movie sounds cool. It, it never came out right because they said they confiscated it because it had <laughs> the ma the um, management like I guess they like put a whole bunch of random disjointed scenes of them in there, and so eventually it got confiscated for evidence <laughs> in their trial. <laughs> yeah i just thought i thought the whole thing was it was just such a crazy story because it's like i mean first of all so this was his first album it was four years after bad out of hell and he had lost his voice basically but it was also like it wasn't just a physiological like it, it was like the yips but for a voice <laughs> like he just like couldn't sing anymore it's like he forgot how to sing <laughs> yeah and so it took him four years to get his shit together and uh, during that time, he was in the movie Roadie, which have you seen that? I haven't, but it's it sounded weird, good it's, based yeah, on, based it's on a, the... It's a bizarre movie because it's like, <laughs> it's like a Blondie vehicle, but uh, but Meatloaf is, it, it plays a Roadie in it. And just like the most random people are in it. Uh, Alice Cooper is in it. Uh, Hank Williams Jr. Like, it's just like, who is this movie for? Like, who yeah. wants to see well, Hank me. Williams Jr. and Blondie in the same movie? It's just, it's bizarre. So, uh, 
yeah, it's like he had to pivot back into acting because he just like couldn't sing anymore. And then he makes this movie and he has these like crooked managers who talk him into turning the album into a into a movie. It's just like the whole thing is just sounds like a total vanity project disaster. I, I wish it had come out. I wonder what happened to that footage. I know. I want to see it. And Cher is in it. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, if nothing else, reading this book has made me want to do a deeper dive into uh, Meatloaf's career because I'm I'm familiar with the with the main two Bad Out of Hells. I don't I don't acknowledge Bad Out of Hell three, but uh, you know one and two are both bangers. But I I haven't really heard that much of Meatloaf's other stuff. Partly because I re- I got into Bad Out of Hell two because I volunteered to write a review of it. And um, I remember that week I was like walking around just like listening to Bad Out of Hell 2 on headphones a lot. And I just realized that like I was overwhelmed. <laughs> I was like overstimulated. <laughs> it was too much. It was like too loud. <laughs> I just I needed to just like listen to something less extreme. So I, I, I did not do a deep dive of Meatloaf's music. <laughs> was that around the same time that you... Uh... Because I remember you were listening to all of Kiss's music, and that was overstimulating too. Yeah, it was a similar. It was a similar experience. Yeah, because like especially when you get to the '80s with Kiss, Paul Stanley's like way up there, and that's when they had the guys playing the like really you know hair metal guitar solos, and so it's like yeah. the whole thing is just like it's it's like the audio equivalent of when you're driving and the sun keeps like coming between the trees and it just like yeah. flashes in your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like too much all at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and that's what listening to bad out of hell two on headphones is, is, is like <laughs> also. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the book, you know, the book ends on a high note, slightly less high note when you, when you realize that uh, uh, he was less than a year away from divorce, but he gets his music back from these managers. Uh, he kind of like buries the hatchet with Jim Steinman, uh, makes a comeback. You know, his career is going well. He's, he's doing movies and stuff. Uh, I liked when they were talking about the, the better the hell to tour and they decided to get the big inflatable bat. <laughs> but the idea came from watching this is Spinal Tap. I just, I just think it's so funny that like in a lot of these rock biographies, they talk about Spinal Tap and it's either them like uh, like recognizing themselves in it and being kind of embarrassed or whatever. Or a lo- a, like weird amount of them are saying they were influenced by Spinal Tap. Right. Like, yeah. I like that it's gone full circle and is now and is now influential. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that is it's funny that you would watch spinal tap and be like yes i want that yeah. because like the whole i know thing and, is- it, and it ended up <laughs> similarly because he got the big bat but i guess it looked like a big chicken and so he would crack up whenever he saw it and not be able to perform i don't know anything else that we need to talk about i just want to talk about the very last bit right before it says the end it yeah. says, you know, he he's talking about um, how he doesn't want to reject, like, the cartoon character of, of Meatloaf anymore. He, he's embracing him. Um, I was going to bring that cartoon to life, put him in living color, and take him on the road. And that's what I did. I came to the realis- realization that, like Popeye, I am what I am, <laughs> and that's all I am. Meatloaf, Meatloaf a day, Michael Lee a day, poor fat Marvin, ML a day, meaty to Sarah Ferguson. <laughs> Sex God, <laughs> Bubby, Leslie's husband, and Dad, Pearl, Pearl and Amanda's father. So, my question to you, do you <laughs> remember what the fuck he's talking about? Like, who was calling him Sex God? Because uh, I, I don't I remember. Don't yeah, remember. I don't remember that at all. Did he? <laughs> who was calling did he just, me like, Sex sneak that God? In? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. I'm like, <laughs> Well, I just uh, I just googled um Meatloaf and Sex God and he has described himself <laughs> as a sex god. Okay, well then that's literally just he's a self-proclaimed sex here's god. Here's a uh, here's you a headline. You know what? This sounds familiar. I think I remember this actually. Yeah, here's a here's a headline uh from 2020, January 2020. Meatloaf says he's a quote sex god. Calls Gre- calls Greta Thunberg quote brainwashed. <laughs> okay, yeah, I remember that exact article. <laughs> and then there's another one: self-confessed sex god Meatloaf, seventy-two on threesomes. 
losing 70 pounds and why he thinks Greta Thunberg has been brainwashed. <laughs> so he was apparently doing a press tour uh, talking about how good he is at sex and also uh, well, and that, he had apparently that climate been doing change that. isn't real. He'd apparently been doing that for at least 20 years because this is in 2000 and that's from 2020. So I just like that every other nickname is like, I'm this person to this person. I'm Bubby, Leslie's husband, a dad, Pearl and Amanda's father. I'm Meaty to Sarah Ferguson, sex god. It's just it's stuck in there. In yeah. the middle, it's like who's exactly. calling me it's sex like he's god? Just, he's just trying to sneak it in, and like <laughs> like nobody's gonna notice. And it snuck, it snuck past me. I, I was probably like rushing to get to get it over with, and then I, I didn't like you know record scratch sex god. Yeah. Like, well, I the, did. Yeah, the thing that stuck out to me this time was uh, that he just casually name drops Sarah Ferguson. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like i do think I'm, I'm remembering like they talk about her a, a little bit right because i feel like i remember i feel like i remember prince andrew coming up i don't remember um, honestly so like it's such a small book and so much happened in it. right exactly <laughs> it's all like it's all a blur i know I, I say that about every book and part of it is probably because i'm not paying close enough attention <laughs> <laughs> but you know what it, it is it's a blur so yeah i guess he just wanted to remind us right at the end that uh he <laughs> and was no, friends with no the duchess other of york point. well yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, but i thought you were still talking about sex but at oh, no yeah. other point does he refer to himself as right that. no yeah and I don't, I, I, like i don't remember i honestly don't remember i don't remember i don't remember him so talking I, about sex like i like yeah. i don't i don't I, I don't remember. I remember him being naked in front of um, Raquel Welch. But he I doesn't don't... really. This is one of the ones that we've read that there's not a whole lot of stuff about sex in here. Like he right. talks about making out in the uh, when they were trying to shop a uh, bed out of hell around during the whole like make out. Oh yeah, part of the Paradise, Paradise by, by the, the Dashboard. Dashboard like... Yeah, and he talks about that being like inspired by his own youthful gropings in cars so i guess that would be the most like yeah but the, there's the not most really... insight we get into meat love sex life other than the fact that he's apparently a god a self-professed sex, <laughs> a god. Self-professed sex um, god yeah but it's not like all the other books we've read there's a lot of like really unwanted stuff about <laughs> people's sex lives in it <laughs> maybe it was uh <laughs> maybe the publisher refused to, <laughs> to to print any of the the sex stories <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah so so there you go beat loaf sex god uh r.i.p to uh the sex sex will never be the same uh now that meat loaf thank is you no for your patience i know this took us a really long time i think we are back on something resembling a normal schedule so yeah, we should be back um, like, I don't know, a week or two into, in, into June and we will do two episodes on Morris Day. Just, you know, everything back to normal until the next time we just can't deal with it anymore. And then we'll take another unscheduled hiatus. And that's just, that's the flow that you've come to expect from us and you should expect nothing else. So <laughs> thanks for listening. Let us know uh, what your thoughts are. I always love hearing from you guys. You can talk to us about meatloaf, talk to us about uh, Morris Day. Um, if you have uh, any meatloaf or Morris Day stories. <laughs> or <laughs> Do you ma- have uh, any firsthand both. knowledge on if meatloaf was a sex god? Please get yeah, back to us. <laughs> I would actually love to know, yeah, if, if there are any uh, sex Part, former sex partners of Meatloaf's who want um, to go, pub, go public with that and, and let us know. Yeah, I, I would be interested in hearing another side of that story because so far we've only really heard we've only really heard Meatloaf, uh, and I feel like he's not a biased source. So yes, please, <laughs> please let us know um, if he really is the sex god he claims to be. Uh, <laughs> you can find us on dystopiadanceparty.com uh you can find us on headbangers bc on twitter and instagram you can also find us dystopian tweets on twitter dystopian gram on instagram and if you really want to you can even email us at headbangers at dystopiadanceparty.com thank you so much and we'll see you again soon